Okay, let's start. I would like to welcome Adam Weiss. I'm very happy that he's here. He's coming from the uh, Advice and Individual Rights in the Europe uh, Center. He can explain much more than I will do uh, what it is. But I'm very happy also because it is part of the clinical program uh, on the human rights and migration law clinic. And uh, I'm happy to have him here because of uh, uh, the fact that he can really explain you because of one different cases at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. So you can really give you an insight what it means to, to run a case there. Uh, on particular items like asylum, migration, trafficking, and so on. So I think it will be a really good opportunity for all of us to, to hear this experience and to ask questions. I guess uh, we will be open for every, every question and any detail that you would like to know. Okay, I hope you are immediately. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Lori. I think it would actually be helpful for me if um, maybe you could go around and you tell me who you are a bit, uh, what your name is, maybe where you're from. Uh, my name is Tatiana, I'm from Russia. Great. I'm Masters from Ethiopia. Great. Thank you, Gal. I'm from Russia. I'm from Russia. I'm from China. 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 Yeah, from Vietnam. Okay. 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 Great. Well, it's really good to talk about migrants, actually, with a group of people from all around the world. I think it makes it really interesting. My name's Adam. I'm based in London, but I'm originally from the U.S. myself. Um, and I work for an organization called the AIR Center, A-I-R-E, Advice on Individual Rights in Europe. Our mission is to promote awareness of European law rights and assist marginalized individuals in those vulnerable circumstances to assert those rights. So that's sort of what it says on the tin. Um, what we do in reality is a couple of things. One of our main activities is that we litigate cases before the European Court of Human Rights. And we do that in a couple of different capacities. We represent victims of human rights violations or potential human rights violations. We act as third party interveners before the European Court. We also assist other representatives who are on the record in the European Court. We also spend a, a large part of our time running an advice service. And that's an advice service for individuals, but also for other lawyers and advisors on European law rights. The vast majority of that work is on EU law on the free movement of persons, and most of it is UK based. So what we're doing is we're responding to a lot of queries from about or from EU migrant citizens and their family members in the UK. Like Italy, the UK has had a large migration of people coming from the new European Union countries, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, the other countries in Central and Eastern Europe that joined the EU in the past decade. The UK also sees a lot of migrants from Western Europe, including Italy. And what we see actually is a lot of family members of migrants from those countries. So family members who may be from outside the European Union and who run into a lot of problems. I wasn't going to focus on that aspect of things today in this presentation, but I'm happy to answer some more questions about that. You might find it interesting because it gets to European Union law. Um, while there are human rights implications to that work, it's much more focused on the sort of typical EU stuff that you might be studying here. Um, and we also take some cases to the domestic courts, usually to the UK courts and tribunals, and often as third parties. So everyone know what I mean when I say third party, or third party intervener. It's what's often referred to in the US system as amicus curiae. It's a separate party who goes into the case to provide the court with information to help them reach a, ju reach a judgment. To tell you a little bit, I'm mainly going to focus on our migration-related work before the European Court of Human Rights. So that's what I'm going to focus in on, and particularly our work with asylum seekers. But we may have some more time at the end. I'm happy to tell you more about some of the other things that we do. And if at any point you have a question about anything that I'm saying, don't hesitate to jump in, because I'd really like it to be a bit of a conversation. I'd like to hear your thoughts about some of the cases that the Air Center has brought, or some of your questions. Uh, so the, we currently have 36 cases 
uh, either pending before the European Court of Human Rights or that we're considering taking to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and what I've done here, I'm sorry, it's a bit small up there on the screen, but I've categorized them by subject so you can see what it is exactly that the Air Center does in the Strasbourg Report. The vast majority of the cases that we have are about people being expelled from European countries. So we have a lot of cases about Article 3 of the European Convention. People who are claiming that when they are expelled from the UK or another European country, there are substantial grounds for believing that there's a real risk they'll be exposed to torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. We do some cases under Article 5 in relation to immigration detention, and I know you've got some of the people here are working on a project related to detention. Uh, and we do quite a few cases related to Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. That's the right to respect for private and family life. And what we're arguing in those cases is that when people are removed, expelled from the European country that they're living in, they'll be separated from their family members or uprooted from their private life, and that their expulsion is a disproportionate interference with their right to respect for private or family life. So you can see that makes up a good almost half of the cases that we take. The second biggest thing that we work on, and actually the two are related, is human trafficking. Do any of you know what the definition of human trafficking is? What is human trafficking? You were nodding in the back. I remember you're from Australia, but I can't remember your name. Uh, I mean, um, yeah. It's when you force, um, well, it's like migration or movement of people, but then there's an element of coercion or Absolutely. force. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Exactly. You've got the movement of people, or it could also be the harboring of people, the receipt of people, and it's by coercion, or by force, or by deception, and it's for the purpose of exploitation. And there's an awful lot of that that happens to Europe and within Europe. So we've got a good seven cases now pending before the European Court of Human Rights, where we're looking at the rights of victims of human trafficking, and in particular, states' failure to respect their positive obligations towards victims of human trafficking, or states that are returning people to places where there are real risk of being trafficked. Uh, we do some work on child abduction, so a kind of migration, a kind of forced migration, if you like. Uh, and then we've got a sort of spattering of other things that we do, ill treatment and detention, property and fair trial. Uh, we've got a case on discrimination and ill treatment. Uh, that's a case that we intervened in, in against Spain that's still pending. Uh, a case about the Chagos Islanders. Are people familiar with the Chagos Islands? It's a, um, uh, a, a, a former British colony in the Indian Ocean. It's called Bayat, the British Indian Ocean Territory. And there are people who have been living there, people who have been living there, I think, since the 17th or the 18th century. And in the 1950s and 60s, they were kicked off of these islands and resettled because the British gave the islands over to the United States to, to have a military base there. And there's still litigation going on to this day about their right um, to return to those islands, or at least to some kind of remedy for what's happened to them. Uh, case about investigation of crime, we've got a case about Roma housing against Bulgaria, a uh, huge issue all around Europe, not actually only in Central and Eastern Europe, but here in Italy and in the UK as well, the rights of Roma. Case about ID documents. Then we've got one case about extradition, uh, which is actually to do with the European arrest warrant. Are you all familiar with the European arrest warrant? You might study it a bit if you get into EU criminal law at all. But it's basically an expedited extradition procedure that exists within European Union member states. And it's, of course, predicated on this idea that all EU member states respect minimum standards of human rights in criminal proceedings. And that all EU member states respect minimum human rights when it comes to things like prison conditions. But of course, that's not true. And in particular, the worry is that Poland puts out massive numbers of these European arrest warrant requests to pick people up all over Europe and bring them back to Poland, but often Polish prisons are not compliant with Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, in terms of where our work is geographically, and I've dirty up a map of Europe here to show you exactly what it is that we do, you can see that uh, a good half of our cases are against the UK. So that's where we're located, that's really where our expertise is, but I think as we're moving forward, we're looking to bring our expertise to bear on cases against other jurisdictions. We're trying to overcome some of the boundaries, like language barriers that would prevent us from working with lawyers in other countries to help them with their cases. But for the time being, most of our cases are against the UK. We've got a couple of cases against France, and a case against France in the UK, uh, and then a sort of spattering of cases around Europe, including a, um, a case against Greece and Italy that we've been involved, involved in. We were involved also in a big case against Italy that was resolved last year. The Hearsay case, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that was a case about migrants at sea. 
and uh, people who were trying to get from Libya, because Gaddafi's Libya at the time, to Italy, to Lampedusa, by boat. And the Italian authorities um, intercepted the boat and returned all the people back to Libya without giving them an opportunity to make claims for international protection. And the European Court of Human Rights found that that was unlawful, that actually the obligation to respect the right to asylum applies even when you intercept someone in international waters at sea. Uh, cases against a bunch of other states as well, including a few against Bulgaria, um, Sweden, Finland, the Czech Republic, Austria, Spain. So what exactly is it that we do? Well, I'm focusing now on the rights of asylum seekers or failed asylum seekers. I'm happy to go into some of the other groups that we've worked with, but I thought that, that might be the most interesting group for you today. So some recent Air Center work on the right to asylum. I've picked five areas that we've, been in, that we've been active in. We've been active in working on the issue of indiscriminate violence. Because as you might know from anything you know about refugee studies, refugee law, when people ask for asylum, what they have to show is a risk of persecution that's quite individualized. And what we've been seeing recently, particularly with conflicts in places like Sri Lanka, and Somalia is that what people are actually afraid of is the general violence that comes from a country in civil war. People are just afraid of being killed, or maybe they're afraid of being killed because they belong to a or, or tortured or subjected to a human degree treatment because they belong to a particular ethnic group or clan, and they're saying, well, just based on that identification alone, I should be protected. Uh, the W two regulation. Is anyone here familiar with the W two regulation? That's an instrument of European Union law that's meant to be the cornerstone of a common European asylum system. I'll talk more about it with you in a few minutes, but the basic idea is that it's an instrument of EU law that's meant to, to tell us which EU member state is responsible for considering someone's asylum claim when an asylum seeker has a relationship with more than one EU member state. For example, someone who entered the EU via Greece and then said, ah, I actually want to be in France, because I speak French or I have family there, so they travel on to France and they claim asylum there. And the question is, which of those two member states is responsible for handling the asylum application, Greece or France? Human trafficking, which we've already talked about, and I'll talk to you about the relationship between human trafficking and asylum. The right to an effective remedy. What kind of remedies do you have when you're claiming that you're going to be sent back to a place where you'll be harmed? And then the right to respect for family life. I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about um, some related issues to asylum. What happens in particular, for example, to asylum seekers who, whose claims fail, but who aren't expelled from the countries that they're living in, and who form families there. And then a few, a few years later, the state authorities finally get around to trying to expel the person. And what are the tools that we use? Sorry, the type there is really tiny. It's my fault, but I'll read it to you. But what are the methods that we use for asserting the rights of the people who fall into these categories? Well, I've got five here in relation to these cases. One is that we represent applicants in the European Court of Human Rights. So we actually go as their lawyers to the Strasbourg Court. Something else that we do is that we do third-party interventions in the European Court of Human Rights. So we go into the European Court as experts, independent experts, trying to tell the court what it needs to do. We're trying to give the court information to help it reach the right decision. We give free legal advice to people, usually to other advisors and lawyers. We do third-party interventions in the domestic courts and the Court of Justice of the European Union. And we send submissions to the European Commission and the European Parliament. Because in a lot of these cases, particularly with the Dublin II regulation, there's European Union law that applies, in addition to the European Convention on Human Rights. It's one of these areas where there's now this sort of proliferation of legal provisions that apply. You'll have in a state, let's say like Italy, national law about the rights of asylum seekers. You have European Union law, which we'll call the European Union Asylum Acquis, which consists of instruments like the Double II regulation, but also the Qualification Directive, Directive 2483, about who actually is a refugee. You have a directive on procedures, Directive 2005-85, which says what the procedures are for going, putting someone through the process of identifying him or her as a refugee. And you have the Reception Conditions Directive, 2003-9, which is a directive that says what the minimum standards are 
in the European Union for providing housing and medical care and material support for asylum seekers. So you have that second layer that applies. And then you have a third layer at Council of Europe level, the European Convention on Human Rights. And then you also have international instruments, the Refugee Convention itself. And what's amazing, actually, in the work that we do at the Air Center is that despite all of these layers of law that exist at all of these different levels to protect people who are seeking refuge, we still see so many people who slip through the cracks. And actually, you might ask whether we don't have too much law. The fact that there are so many overlapping legal regimes maybe creates confusion that makes it even harder for states to apply these, um, these provisions. Any questions about the work of the Air Center generally before I move on to delve into these specific topics? Am I making sense to you all, at least? Okay, great. All right, I thought what I would do is I would tell you a little bit about what it's like to take a case to the European Court of Human Rights, because I thought you might find that interesting. Um, I'm not expecting you to be able to read that chart. I really put it up there so that you can just get a sense of the complexity of the whole thing. This is the European Court of Human Rights perspective on the process uh, of taking a case before that court. Um, and what you see actually is that the European Court splits it up into three different levels. There are proceedings at national level. The idea before the European Court of Human Rights is that the European Court is a subsidiary mechanism. So that court doesn't kick in until something has gone wrong at the national level. The idea of subsidiarity being this idea that it should be the lowest level that should deal with something. So if you have someone who comes to Italy to claim asylum, it should be the Italian authorities that deal with that asylum claim. And it should be the Italian courts that manage an appeal if there's a problem, if the person uh, is unlawfully refused. If things don't work out, though, in the domestic courts, or there are no remedies in the domestic courts, you can go to the European Court of Human Rights. And that's actually what happened in the Hearsay case. These people who got in boats in Libya and tried to make their way to Lampedusa so that they could claim asylum in Italy and Europe, they were caught, they were intercepted by an Italian, I think it was a Coast Guard boat, that brought them back to Libya, thanks a lot. And they didn't have time or opportunity to pursue any remedies, right? They said to the Italian authorities in the boats, we want to claim asylum. And the Italian authorities said, too bad, you're not in Italy. We're not going to hear those claims. So no one decided their asylum claims. They didn't get to go to any courts. So they got to go straight to the European Court of Human Rights. Well, and then you see what happens in the European Court of Human Rights. It's pretty complicated. Right? The European Court of Human Rights is a victim of its own success, everyone says. It's dealing with human rights violations taking place in 47 countries throughout the Council of Europe, any of the countries that you are all from, uh, including Ukraine and Russia, for example. Um, so it's overwhelmed. And people send in applications about all kinds of matters that are completely irrelevant to the European Convention on Human Rights. Right? I'm having a property dispute with my neighbor, and they send a case to the European Court of Human Rights. And someone in Strasbourg has to look at that case and decide that it's inadmissible and send it back to them. So you've got a layer here of admissibility to see if the case actually raises an issue under the European Convention on Human Rights, whether it meets the procedural criteria. And then it eventually goes through to one of four different judicial formations, either a single judge who says this application is rubbish and throws it away, or a committee of three judges which can say the same thing, or a chamber of seven judges, which might take a substantive uh, judgment in the case, or a grand chamber of 17 judges, which will handle the case. The Hearsay case that I've been mentioning about Italy, that went to a grand chamber of 17 judges, who unanimously found that Italy had violated the European Convention on Human Rights because of the way they treated those people uh, in the boat. But it doesn't end, of course, when you get your judgments, because the problem now is that, can we be sure today that if the Italian Coast Guard is out there somewhere in the Mediterranean and they come across a boat full of people who'd like to come to Europe and seek asylum, that they're going to behave properly. I don't think we can yet be confident of that. <coughs> Measures need to be taken in Italy or in any state when there's a violation found in order to give effect to the judgment, to execute the judgment. And that's where this process comes in. And what will happen now is that a political body at the level of the Council of Europe, called the Committee of Ministers, will um, oversee the execution of the judgment, 
presumably in the case of Italy, they'll want to see that those Coast Guard people are being trained properly on how to handle these situations. They'll want to see some change, I would think, in Italian law to make it clear that when people are intercepted at sea by the Italian authorities and they ask for asylum, their asylum claims have to be considered, which will inevitably involve them being brought ashore. So that sort of thing. And in terms of a, a high-level overview of the process over the European Court of Human Rights, there are really two stages to that process. The first is admissibility. You ask whether the application is even one that the court can consider, and there are a series of criteria for that. The first is whether you've exhausted domestic remedies. Have you gone through the domestic courts with your claim? The second is whether you comply with the six-month rule. Did you apply to the court within six months of the last decision in the case? And then there are a bunch of other criteria. Your application cannot be anonymous, for example. It has to be brought against a Council of Europe member state. It can't be brought against Belarus, for example, which is the last European country not to be in the Council of Europe. Any questions about the high-level process of taking something to the Strasbourg court? I thought I'd also give you sort of a look at what the case looks like from the air center's perspective, what we experience the case like in our little office in a small attic in London. The first thing that we do when we're notified of a case is that we send a letter of introduction to the court, assuming that we're within the six-month time limit. The purpose of that letter, which is about a two-page letter, is to stop time, to stop the six months. Um, I can give you an example from a non-asylum area. We had a case called AA versus the United Kingdom, which was about a young man from Nigeria who came to the UK legally to live with his mother and sisters who had already come because the mom was led in to be a nurse for labor migration. When he was 15 years old, he committed a very serious criminal offense. He was convicted of gang rape. Um, but thereafter, he was a model of youth offender rehabilitation. He got out of uh, the youth offender institution, the juvenile prison, very early and reintegrated really well into society, uh, finished a secondary education and went to university. But the UK still decided that they wanted to throw him out of the country because they were trying to rid the country of all the foreign criminals. I'm sure that that's something that you hear the Italian authorities trying to do as well. So after he lost his case in the English courts, we sent the letter of introduction. Ooh. High technology. Uh, we sent the letter of introduction to the European court saying, we want to challenge his deportation. We think it will violate his right to respect for family life. The court wrote us back, and they gave us eight weeks to submit the full application. That's how they fill out on a form. And the main bits of the form are the statement of the facts and the statements of the violations. So we filled out that form and sent the full application to the court. Now, in our case, the court then sat on the application for two years. And you can understand why. That court is extremely overwhelmed. They have something like 140,000 applications that they still haven't made their way through on their docket right now. So they sat on it for two years. Our client was thrilled with that because he didn't want to leave the UK. Now, there was nothing stopping the UK from deporting him during that process. But I guess the UK authorities felt like they shouldn't do that while he had a case pending in the European court. After two years, the court communicated the case to the UK government and asked the UK government to make observations. At that point, we applied for legal aid from the Council of Europe if our client is eligible for it, a full 850 euros, not a lot of money. Uh, we tell NGOs that may be interested in intervening as third parties, although we didn't feel that it was necessary to do that in this case. But if we have a case about a larger issue, or an issue where we feel that NGOs might be able to help the court with something, we'll tell them. The government submitted its observations on the application. They said, no, no, no. This guy is a no good criminal. We need to get rid of him from the UK. Um, we were submitted our observations and the government's observations say, well, he was a very bad criminal back in the day, but we believe that people can change. Uh, of course, we did this for our signing case law and signing the standards of the court. Uh, we also uh, put in a submission for just satisfaction. Now, just satisfaction means money, the amount of money you get for having been a victim of a human rights violation. In any case, we didn't want any money. We just wanted a finding that he wasn't going to be, that his deportation from the UK wouldn't be legal. The court then delivered its judgment in September of last year, saying that it would be illegal for the UK to expel him. And we then followed up with the government and the necessary with the Committee of Ministers. We didn't have to follow up with the Committee of Ministers in that case, because we wrote to the government, and we said to them, what are you going to do now if there's been this judgment? 
And they wrote back to us and they said, we're reinstating his residence rights and he will not be deported. And so that's all that needs to be done. Any questions about the process before the, the European court? The court doesn't really have hard and fast criteria for this. There's a rule of court, that's Rule 44, Paragraph 3, that says that in a bit of the convention, Article 36 of the convention, that says that the court can invite anyone to intervene in a case if the court thinks it would be helpful. There's no case law from the court as to why or why not they'll allow someone to intervene. Um, it's a bit frustrating, actually, because what I see happening in the court is that it really depends what section of the court you're in. For the UK cases that we've had, we've never seen an example where someone was refused permission to intervene as a third party, certainly as an NGO. Um, it doesn't just have to be an NGO, actually. Other governments can intervene in cases. Um, if your citizen is an applicant, but the case is against another country, so for example, we took a case on behalf of an Albanian woman, but against the UK, Albania had a right to intervene in the case. Uh, that comes from under the convention. And sometimes individuals want to intervene in cases. There was a case, um, it's a bit of a soap opera kind of a case, of an Irish woman who was married, but got pregnant by another man. And she uh, didn't want to um, raise the baby at all. And she didn't want to have the baby associated with her. And in Ireland, when you give birth, the baby, you'll, the parent's name will always be on the birth certificate. The baby will someday be able to find out who the parent is, and the same in England. So she went to France. Because in France, you can give birth uh, under X, Suzy's, and the, the child's name is never, your name is never associated with the child. So she desperately wanted to do this in order not to have anything to do with the child. She gave up the child, and then she went back to, uh, she had, gave birth to the child and gave up the child, Suzy's, and then went back to Ireland and made up with her husband, and she and her husband decided they wanted to raise the baby on there together. So she went back to France and said, can I have my baby back, please? And they said, no. You've given up your child, Suzy's. You had 14 days to, to claw the child back, and you missed the deadline. Um, in that case, the natural child of the father, the biological child of the father, was added as a third party to the case, so that he could sort of add his two cents to the whole soap opera. Um, so you do see cases like that where someone else who's involved, a person who's involved, comes into the case. Um, in that case, was it helpful? I didn't think it was particularly helpful, but the court generally will let people in. But then we had a case I'm going to talk to you about in a few minutes about um, uh, called Osman versus Denmark, about a person that we thought was trafficked by her father out of Denmark to Kenya, where she was forced uh, to, into basically forced labor. Um, we had two NGOs lined up asking for permission to intervene in the case to give the court information about intrafamilial trafficking, this thing where sometimes parents can traffic their own children. The court rejected those requests for intervention which was the first signal that we had from the court that they didn't want to consider the case as a trafficking case. Uh, we did win the case, but not as a trafficking case. Um, but I think it's pretty arbitrary, to be honest. And if that had been a case against the UK, I'm very confident that our NGO partners would have been the And what's the interest of NGOs in the Why are they usually doing I suppose, I mean, we intervene in quite a few cases. I think it's because we have specific strategic legal outcomes that we want to achieve for the people that we work with. And so if we're not taking a case ourselves, it gives us an opportunity to steer the court towards the right answer to a question um, in a way that helps our clients in the long run. Um, I'll give you the example in a few minutes of when we intervened in a trafficking case. I can give you an example of a case that we recently intervened in. So I mentioned to you before these European arrest warrants, where basically one European Union country can zip someone to that country from another EU country very, very quickly under a sort of expedited extradition arrangement. Um, I don't know if you all know about Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks guy. The big case in, his big case in England is about being uh, uh, sent back to Sweden under a European arrest warrant. Uh, it's that kind of thing. Um, we have a, there was a case taken to that court about a Polish woman living in the UK. And she was convicted of a criminal offense in 2005 in Poland. A pretty violent offense. She kicked someone in the head pretty badly. Um, she was sentenced to 12 months in prison, but in the Polish prisons at the time, this might still be the case now, they don't have room in the prisons. So what they tell you when you're convicted is you've got a 12-month sentence, we don't have room for you right now, we'll let you know when your sentence is going to start. In 2007, she moved to England, which was within her rights to be as a new citizen, with her two children and her partner. She had two more children in England, and then in 2010 she gets the call 
right? Or rather, they arrest her under a European arrest warrant saying, time to go back to Poland to serve your sentence. Now, we are very concerned about the human rights implications of the sort of speedy, unreflective application of the European arrest warrant. And this is exactly the kind of case where there's a problem, right? Because she's got her own personal life now, her private life, her family life in England, and she's being uprooted from all of that to serve a sentence that was handed down five years ago, completely disproportionate in our view. Someone else was taking the case, but we wanted to make sure that the court came to the right decision in that case. We wanted to make sure that the court had before it all of the information that it needed about the way the European arrest warrant works, about the excessive numbers of European arrest warrants issued by Poland every year, um, about other case law from this court and other courts that the applicant's lawyers might not bring up. Um, I suppose in that case it was probably more to do with the fact that we weren't confident that the applicant's lawyers were going to do the best possible job of bringing up all of these arguments. That's not the only reason why we would do it, though. Sometimes the applicants will come to us and they will say, can you come in on this case and provide more information? Um, in the Hearsay case, we, in which we intervened, that case about the migrants coming from, by boat from Libya to Lampedusa, we wanted to come in and provide expertise on the law of the sea, because that's a very complicated area that applies to what the relationship between refugee law and the law of the sea. And so what we did actually was we um, taxed the expertise of people working at the German Human Rights, uh, the German Institute for Human Rights, who had a lot of expertise in this area, and distilled a lot of their work into our intervention so that the court had access to that. Um, because it was something that we didn't think that the applicants were going to come before the court. Is there precedent for universities or research institutes to intervene? There definitely is, actually. In the Hearsay case, the Columbia Law School Human Rights Clinic intervened. Um, and there's no restriction. Anyone can intervene. Anybody can intervene. Um, so I don't see any, anything wrong with the clinic intervening. I think, actually, universities have a really good uh, opportunity to use a lot of the research that's been done uh, and put that before the court. I think what the court's looking for in these third-party interventions is for people who have a lot of expertise already about something and who can quickly distill it into a short document. Um, it's a 10-page limit on a third-party intervention, so the court doesn't want you to send them tons and tons of stuff. But for example, if someone, if you've got an academic who's written the report or the paper or the book on some particular issue, then what you could do is get that academic to distill his or her learning into that short 10 pages and put it in. Um, we've got a case now that we're taking that I'll talk to you about as well about a woman asylum seeker uh, uh, from Sri Lanka who was returned to Sri Lanka and her claim failed. Um, there's an NGO in London that wrote a report on the fate of women asylum seekers in Britain, a 200-page report that's great. And he said to them, well, it would be really good if you went in as a third-party intervener in our case, and you distilled that report into 10, 10 really punchy pages for the courts so that they can see the problems that women asylum seekers that women asylum seekers in Britain face, problems being believed, or problems with the assumption that, oh, no one will harm you because you're a woman. That's sort of thing. Yeah. Sorry, I would like to know what happened to the applicant where the decision of the court is yet pending. There are a couple of things that might happen. Um, I'll talk to you in a minute about a couple of cases where we've gotten what are called Rule 39 measures. But if you have, let's say we're talking about a migrant who's facing expulsion from a country, it's possible to ask the European Court of Human Rights to issue an interim measure, which is like an injunction, which orders the government to do something or not to do something. And most of those Rule 39 measures order the government not to expel a person while a case is pending. Now, we've been able to secure those measures in a couple of cases where what we're saying is that there is an imminent risk of irreparable harm. So for example, I mentioned to you before, and I'll, I'll go into it in more detail, an Albanian woman that we worked with. She was actually living here in Italy, perfectly lawfully. She was trafficked from Italy to a city in Britain called Leeds in the north of England, where she was forced uh, to work in a sex club. She went through the entire asylum process, claiming asylum in Britain, not to be sent back from Alba to Albania, but she was refused. We wrote to the European Court of Human Rights and said we want to challenge her expulsion to Albania, and we want to ask for an interim measure in the meantime to force the UK not to expel her while these proceedings are pending, because we're saying she'll be killed by the traffickers if she's sent back to Albania. So the court issued the interim measure in that case. 
Um, in cases where what we're claiming is not quite as severe, I mentioned to you the AA case about the Nigerian guy who had committed a serious criminal offense when he was younger. He wasn't claiming anything bad would happen to him when he went back to Nigeria. What he was claiming was that it would be a disproportionate interference with his right to respect for family to be separated from his family. But in the worst case scenario, he'd be separated from them for a few years and then eventually be brought back. There's nothing irreparable about that situation. So we didn't feel we could ask for an interim measure in that case. So in that case, he might very well have been deported during the proceedings, but he wasn't, fortunately. Uh, in the Hirsi case with the migrants who were sent back to Libya, well, they were sent back to Libya. So there was nothing that could be done. Now, I think there were about 35 of them. They showed up in different places to the extent that the lawyers were able to track them down. A couple of them made their way back to Europe and eventually, I think, got asylum in Norway. Some of them were still in detention camps in Libya where people from Amnesty International had been able to make contact with them because people from Amnesty were going around to the detention camps in Libya trying to talk to people. Um, some of them disappeared. A few of them made their way back to Lampedusa eventually, claimed asylum in Italy. Some of them had their asylum claims still pending. Some of them had been granted refugee status. Um, but there was nothing the European Court of Human Rights could do to help them. I think that's one of the important things about going to the European Court of Human Rights, actually. I mentioned before that it's a subsidiary mechanism. It's a, that means that it's a mechanism that kicks in when things have failed at national level, when the national system for the protection of human rights isn't working. So already when you've made your way to the European Court, there's a failure. The, the, most of the harm has already happened, probably. And you can't really expect the European Court to do very much. The only exception to that, I would say, is the cases where we've been able to obtain those interim measures, stop the removals, and the European Court of Human Rights has been able to say that there's a potential violation here that would take place if you remove the person. Um, but I think it's important to appreciate that, that when you go to the European Court of Human Rights, you know, everyone's complaining now that the European Court of Human Rights is taking on too many cases. Uh, particularly the states are complaining about, oh, the European Court of Human Rights is doing too much. But what states need to realize is that the European Court of Human Rights is intervening because our systems for protecting human rights are failing. Uh, they're failing because, for example, in the Hearsay case, the Coast Guards weren't trained enough to do what they were doing. But they fail in England sometimes because even those really brilliant judges that we have, wearing their wigs and their robes, don't know the law well enough or make bad decisions. Um, and that's really what's going on, I think, when you're at European level. There's a failure there that we all have to realize. Any other questions about this process? The one thing I would mention is that, you know, you'll know you note that I didn't put up a box here for about a hearing. The European Court of Human Rights rarely holds hearings in cases. And in the vast majority of the Arsenal's cases, there is no hearing. So the European Court doesn't get to see the lawyers, doesn't hear evidence from the witnesses. It's all done on the papers which shows you actually that the European Court really is looking down from a European level. It doesn't have real contact with the people involved. So you can just severely limit the extent to which they can understand the issues. Um, the AA case that I mentioned to you about the Nigerian guy, I met the lawyer from the European Court who had worked on the case from inside the court who had written the judgment soon after it came out. And she said to me, I was just praying that the press weren't going to find out that they'd been committing more crimes clandestinely while all this was going on. Of course, we were claiming that he was this rehabilitated, uh, wonderful member of society, contributing, working, and all that kind of stuff. But they don't have that day-to-day -day contact with the people. They're quite, um, quite <laughs> Yeah? Just a technical question. Um, if the court requires further evidence, does it contact the lawyer? It parties? does, yeah. What the court will do is they will contact us if they want more material from us, and they'll ask us to provide it. And often what happens is they'll, they'll come to us and they'll say, can you give us a witness statement to update us about the case? Or can you give us this document or that document? And in a lot of cases what they'll do is they'll ask the government to provide information. And interestingly, if they ask the government to provide information, and the government fails to do that, the government are committing a violation of the convention, because the government have an obligation to facilitate the court's work. Uh, I think the best example of this would be some of the Russian cases that have happened recently, where people have complained that the Russian authorities didn't properly investigate certain um, crimes. And what the court has said to the Russian government is, please produce the full police dossier for us. We want to see the full police dossier. And the Russian government say, oh no, we're not going to give you that. 
So in addition to the substantive violation of the convention, Russia also violates the convention by not cooperating with the court. Um, they can't do the same to the parties, but they will ask us for more evidence. Now, there is a, the court does have a power to, to undertake fact-finding missions, in theory. But I mentioned to you how overwhelmed the court is, so it's going to be pretty rare that the court's going to go off on a fact-finding mission. Interestingly, the majority of fact-finding missions have been to Turkey. Um, I'm sure you'll all be familiar to some extent with the situation in Turkey in terms of the rights of Kurdish people um, and the, the kinds of uh, military operations that have gone on, the sort of day-to-day -day violence that Kurdish people have experienced in Turkey. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights has played a huge role in exposing all of that. And one of the things that they've done is that groups of judges have gotten on a plane to Turkey and taken evidence with people. But it's pretty rare that they'll do that in, in, in other cases. And I think it would be pretty unlikely that they would do it in one of our cases. Just before we move on, um, I'm sure we get to remedies. What happens in the outlier countries, Turkey or Russia, which are not very cooperative on the enforcement of judgments? Interesting directives. Yeah. You know, compensation sometimes I know yeah. they do here, but especially changing state practice. Yeah. Um, it's a real challenge. I mean, it's out of the court's hands because the court's not responsible for the execution of its own judgments. So it's in the hands of this political body, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. That's probably not a good solution for human rights, because the Committee of Ministers is what it sounds like. It's 27 ministers from the governments. So the theory, I suppose, is that, yeah, let's say Russia is in the hot seat for some things that have been done in Turkey, or Turkey is in the hot seat for some things that have been done. And all 46 ministers sit around the table and glare at the minister from Turkey and say, what are you doing? And that minister is supposed to be horribly embarrassed, or supposed to do, right? But in reality, you can imagine what happens. Because the minister for Turkey has, of course, all these things that Turkey has done, but then Britain's done bad things as well, right? The big, the big bad thing that Britain has done is that in Britain we don't allow prisoners to vote. If you're in prison on election day, no matter what you've done, no matter how minor, you cannot vote. And the European Court of Human Rights found seven years ago that that was a human rights violation, but Britain's done nothing about it, because the British people are attached to this principle. So presumably what really happens is that the Turkish guy and the British guy, assuming that they're all men, so probably are, right, talk to each other during the coffee break and say, well, if you don't make a big deal about me torturing those Kurdish people, I won't make a big deal about you not letting the prisoners vote. And I'd like to think that it doesn't really happen that way, but to some extent, that's what it lends itself to. Um, now, the Committee of Ministers has, has streamlined its procedures a little bit to allow it to focus on the hardest cases, and they do get scrutiny. Um, and with, with, to be fair to Turkey, Turkey has actually implemented a lot of the judgments. Um, and things have turned around quite a bit in Turkey. I mean, it's, in, it's no longer the dark days of the 80s and 90s. Um, things aren't great, but it's, it's not the mess that it once was. But it's been slow going. Um, there is a procedure now whereby the, sort of the good states get a bit of a pass in the Committee of Ministers, and the bad states get more scrutiny. I don't think that's a good thing either, though, because that just gives the license to the good states to be hit badly. Uh, what else can be done? There's now a procedure by which the European Court of Human Rights can direct states to take specific measures in cases, which was not the case in the past. It used to be that the European Court would just say, there's been a violation, pay X amount of euros. Now what the European Court of Human Rights can do is say, uh, you need guidance from us on what to do. Um, and the European Court of Human Rights will say, change this law, because it's a bad law. So now everyone can look at the state and say, well, they told you to change the law, change the law. But ultimately, if the state doesn't do anything, then nothing happens. Um, I think the real problem now is with Russia, um, and particularly with some of the systemic problems in Russia and elsewhere. Um, the ultimate sort of nuclear option is to kick Russia out of the Council of Europe, but nobody wants to do that. So I suppose what happens is that they get away with it. Um, I mean, I think the real answer probably, though, is that you just chip away over time. Um, I'll talk to you in a few minutes about a case about human trafficking in Cyprus. Massive problem in Cyprus. Human traffickers get away with all kinds of crazy things there, bringing women in from Moldova and Russia and other countries for forced sex work. Uh, there was this big case about it, but the big case doesn't mean that human trafficking and sexual exploitation disappear overnight in Cyprus. But it does mean that you have one more tool now when you go to the Cypriot government with it. Uh, but I think it is a really important point. It's not, it's not a massive cure, it's not a panacea for anything. Um, it is just one tool that human rights advocates have, um, and you need to use it. I mean, I, you know, living now through this situation in Britain with the prisoners voting, uh, it's very, very frustrating. You wind up with a bit of a constitutional crisis because we have a court ruling 
I mean, we've written as a country with a very strong tradition of the rule of law, common law jurisdiction, with real respect for judges and case law and that sort of thing. And Parliament saying no, because something like 78% of people in the UK like the, the ban on prisoner voting. You also have the Human Rights Act. So we have the Human Rights Act as well. Can you go back to a domestic jurisdiction and ask for a, a ruling to implement? European Court of well, the Human Rights Act is a funny thing. Uh, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Human Rights Act is a, is a piece of British legislation, UK legislation, that incorporated the European Convention of Human Rights into our domestic legal system in the UK. Because unlike in Italy, international treaties don't automatically apply in UK law. Uh, but the problem is that the Human Rights Act doesn't actually say that the convention overrides parliamentary legislation. Um, it says that if there's a conflict between a primary act of parliament and the European Convention, all the courts can do is make a declaration of incompatibility and send the ball back to Parliament. So in this case, we have a pr primary legislation from Parliament that says prisoners can't vote, so the courts can't do anything. Uh, they can make declarations of incompatibility. Um, they can even award damages. Well, I'm trying to think, actually. No, I don't think a domestic court would be able to award damages because of the act of Parliament that's there. Um, because it's primary legislation. What has happened though, is that people can go back to Stratford, and they have. There's another case, NT and Greens versus UK. And so now what Stratford does is they basically, every time we have a general election in Britain, thousands and thousands of people send applications to Stratford. They all get awarded a couple thousand pounds in damages, and the, and the government pay. So it's. it's and the other, other question is a bit more nebulous, not precisely the European rule, but when you, have, you obviously at air have a certain, as you said, strategic agenda, mm. and then you're also representing people with specific problems. There are going to be times, obviously, where those will not exactly mesh your own internal declarations of incompatibility. Yeah. So the issue is then how do you, because you, you're functioning with two hats. Yeah. One as an advocate for people and the other as an advocacy organization. And, and this is something I've had many conversations with because I'm on, only on one side of this problem. Is, is how do you then resolve that? You know, in a particular case, if you have a particular requirement for the person you're representing or a group of people which is not exactly compatible mm -hmm. with your advocacy strategic goals. We put the client first. Um, I suppose we feel that we have to. Um, and I don't think we've ever had a real crisis around that at the Center. But the real issue for us comes with friendly settlements. Right. Because you might have a situation, you have a process by which you can have a friendly settlement before the European Court of Human Rights. So for example, with the Albanian trafficking victim, whose case we took, everyone wanted there to be a judgment finding that Albanian trafficking victims need to be protected from being expelled back to Albania. We would love to be the organization that delivered that. That said, look, then we took the case that brought that. But the UK looked at the case and said, oh, we're very happy to settle this. We're going to give her refugee status. No need for a case anymore. Right. But in that case, we have to take it. Um, so that's the way that we resolve it. I suppose the, the solution is that we could then, there are a couple of things that we could do. Use the outcome strategically. So a friendly settlement does give rise to a friendly settlement decision from the Strasbourg court. Circulate that. Tell people to use that in their own cases. Um, and then intervene in other cases. Because when we're a third party intervener, we're not restricted in the same way. We can make those strategic points. Um, we can even disagree with the applicant if we want to. Um, and I'll mention one case actually in a few minutes where we've got, we have a disagreement with the applicants. Um, we have a different interpretation of the law than they do. Our obligation in that case is only to our own perspective. To take you through some of the, um, the substantive areas that we've been working on with asylum seekers, one is indiscriminate violence. I mentioned the situation that we had, uh, um, uh, the situation about that exists in places like Somalia or up until recently Sri Lanka, where there's been such a situation of generalized violence, or such a situation of generalized violence affecting certain areas or certain people, that we're saying you don't have to identify yourself as a potential victim of violence. It's enough to say that you belong to this group, or in the case of Somalia, to say that you're going back to Somalia because it is just so bad there. Um, we've had a few cases where we've actually represented applicants of the European Court of Human Rights. NA versus United Kingdom was a case back in 2008 where we were able to establish that anyone who was a young Tamil man being sent back to Sri Lanka was at real risk of inhuman integrated treatment or torture. And the court more or less found that. Sufi and Ali is a case that we won towards the middle of last year, finding essentially that sending anyone back to Somalia put that person at risk. 
and was therefore unlawful, unless you could prove that that person had access to special protection. And the evidence that we used in that case was things like the fact that people will actually shoot at the planes as they land in Mogadishu Airport. So the violence sort of begins before you even hit the ground. Um, the European court accepted that. Um, we tried this in the domestic courts as well. I put up here a provision of Article 15C of the Qualification Directive. So if any of you are familiar with the Refugee Convention, you might know that it's actually a pretty sparse document. What it says is that you're entitled to refugee status, or you're a refugee if there's, you're at risk of persecution on one of five convention grounds. But it doesn't actually say much about what persecution is. Um, and it doesn't talk about any other forms of protection. The European Union is engaged in this really interesting experiment of creating a regional asylum system. So the first time that a group of countries have come together and said you can actually get refuge in Europe. We're supposed to be reaching a point where actually you won't be a refugee in Italy or in the UK, but you will be a European Union refugee, who presumably at some stage you can move around the same way that European Union citizens move around. And so one of the things that the European Union has done is it's given content at European Union level to this right to refugee protection. And one of the things that the European Union said was that sometimes you're not a refugee, but you still deserve protection. In Italy, you call this, it's called humanitarian protection. At EU level, it's called subsidiary protection. And Article 15C of the directive is one of the ways that you can get subsidiary protection. And that's if you're at real risk of serious harm, which consists of serious and individual threat to a civilian's life or person by reason of indiscriminate violence in situations of international or internal armed conflict. Now, if you actually look at that sentence, it makes no sense. Individual threat to a civilian's life by reasons of indiscriminate violence. Well, the whole point of something being indiscriminate is that it's not individual, right? So what on earth could that possibly mean, individual, indiscriminate? And this has been one of the things that we've been really chewing over in the courts. And the other thing that we've been chewing over in the courts is to how much, to how much does that provision of EU law match up to the protection that Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights provides? So there are there situations where, Europe, where Article 3 of the ECHR doesn't apply, but EU law does apply? Are the two systems matching up to one another? In the NA case, which was about young Tamil men being sent back to Sri Lanka, this was the conclusion that the court reached. A general situation of violence will not normally in itself entail a violation of Article 3 in the event of an expulsion. Indeed, the court has rarely found a violation of Article 3 on that ground alone. So the court was suggesting actually that EU law might go further than the European Convention on Human Rights. But then we got the court's judgment in the Sufi and only case. The jurisdiction of this court is limited to the interpretation of the convention. It would not be appropriate for this court to give an interpretation of Article 15C of the directive, because the European, Union, European Convention on Human Rights is a Council of Europe body, not an EU body. However, based on the, the Court of Justice's interpretation, in another case, the court is not persuaded that Article 3 of the Convention does not offer comparable protections to that afforded under the directive. So anyone who likes to write in good English, you can see that they're not doing a very good job here. The court is not persuaded that the Convention does not offer, right? So I guess they are persuaded that it does offer the same protection. In particular, it notes that the threshold set by both provisions may, in exceptional circumstances, be attained in consequence of a situation of general violence of such intensity that any person being returned to the region in question would be at risk simply on account of their presence there. So what we have is the European Court of Human Rights and EU law meshing a bit. And this idea that you can be sent back to a place where it's literally the bullets whizzing by your head that put you at risk. And so you can't be sent back there. Um, now we're quite proud of the answer because we were, these are both cases that we took to the European Court. One thing that we tried to intervene in, just to go back a second, in the uh, English courts was that we intervened in a case about children in Afghanistan. To what extent does the standard differ if you're talking about children? Should there be a higher threshold that applies to children? Now, in the events, the court felt that it didn't, the English court felt that it didn't need to rely on Article 15 C of the directive because it found that the child in that case was a refugee. But that's an interesting question. Is it the same standard for adults and children when talking about indiscriminate 
violence. Uh, the second issue I wanted to focus on was the Dublin II regulation. I've already mentioned this to you a little bit. You have a situation now where there's free movement of people within the European Union. The vast majority of the European Union consists of the Schengen space, so this border-free zone where people can move around without any restrictions. For example, if you wanted to go on a holiday to France, I understand it's just 60 kilometers away from here, you can just drive to the border, right? No one's going to check your passport anymore. Well, that's great for asylum seekers, too. Because asylum seekers now can come to the European Union and go from one EU member state to the other and maybe look for the state where they've got the best shot at getting refugee status. So you can imagine the panic of EU member states thinking about this, particularly the panic of the state that I live in, Britain, which is so panicked that it won't even join the Schengen zone, because you know if you go on holiday to the UK, you still have to show your passport at the border. But that's not enough for the British. They're still afraid their asylum seekers will sneak into the UK, and so they participate in this regulation as well. So there's a system for figuring out which member state is responsible for your application, and there's a hierarchy of criteria that apply. So they basically look at these criteria and they say the first one that you hit is going to be the one that applies. So if, for example, you're an unaccompanied child with a family member in another member state of the European Union, you should be sent to that family member, so sent to that state to have your asylum claim heard. And then you make your way down, your, down the list and it's things like if you have a residence document issued by a member state of the EU, you should go to that state. And then you make your way further down. If you've made an illegal border crossing, into the European Union. It is the first member state into, into whose territory you cross. Well, guess what? Almost 90% of the illegal migrants, the illegal border crossings in the EU, happen into Greece. That's an awful lot for a tiny little member state on the southeast corner of Europe. And as we all know, Greece is probably not, for other reasons, very well equipped to handle this massive influx of migrants. Indeed, in addition to all the other problems that beset Greece, they have the problem of not having a functioning asylum system at all, with tens, and th tens of thousands of asylum seekers sleeping rough, sleeping in the streets of Athens and other cities in Greece, because they're not given any access to any kind of support, even though European Union law requires it. So you've got this system which is great for countries like Britain and Denmark and Sweden on the northwestern edges of Europe where it's really hard to get to if you're an asylum seeker. Because if anyone happens to make their way too far north and too far west, having already been in the southeast of Europe, those countries can just send them right back. And the UK was doing this, uh, many countries were doing this very happily, sending Greece tens, hundreds of asylum seekers every year, saying, your problem, you deal with them. But because the system in Greece was broken, it became a huge issue. And this is something that we got involved in. A case called MSS v. Belgium in Greece. This sort of reached a fever pitch with all of these asylum seekers being sent back to Greece and the Greek government privately telling its EU partners, we can't handle this. We don't have the resources. And the government saying, too bad, you signed up to this system. Right? It isn't a burden sharing system. It's just a system for sorting out who, uh, which states people belong to. So what did we do in that case? Well, that case involved a, um, an Afghan national who was sent back to Greece. Interestingly, he asked the European court for a Rule 39 measure, the one we were talking about before. He asked the court to stop him from being sent back to Greece. And the court said no. The court said, if you, basically, if you've got a problem in Greece, you bring your case against Greece. Greece is also subject to the jurisdiction of this court. So he gets sent back to Greece, and what happens to him? Well, he winds up homeless in a park in Athens. He can't get a home. Why can't he get a home? Because when he goes to the authorities to register as an asylum seeker, they say, please give us your address. And he says, I have no address. They said, well, until you give us an address, we can't possibly give you the car that you need in order to get housing. So you get this sort of ridiculous bureaucratic cycle that would be common to anyone in any European country. Um, so he's left there homeless. He actually winds up getting detained for a few days, twice. He gets detained once when he arrives, first arrives in Greece, back from Belgium, and then he, he gets a fake identity card and tries to hop an easy jet flight to France to claim asylum in France, and they detain him at the airport again. And so what did the European Court of Human Rights found? Well, the European Court of Human Rights found that Greece had subjected him to inhuman and degrading treatment. And that was really interesting. Because in the past, there's never been a right to be housed 
right? There's no right to be free from homelessness in Europe under the European Convention. But they found that if you're an asylum seeker and there's law saying that you should be housed, then it's inhuman and degrading not to house you because asylum seekers are particularly vulnerable. And they found that he was subjected to inhuman and degrading conditions in the detention center. But more interesting than that, they found that Belgium had violated his human rights, his right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment, by sending him to Greece. This was actually revolutionary. The European Court of Human Rights has not hesitated in the past to find that it's a human integrated to send people back to Somalia or to Sri Lanka or to other places where bad things happen to people in certain contexts. Indeed, they even once found that you couldn't send someone back to the United States of America because he was going to be put on death row. But the idea of finding that you couldn't send someone back from one European Union member state to another European Union member state really undermines the whole idea that, that is behind all of this legislation, right? The only reason why you can have the Dublin system is if you have the assumption that all EU member states will abide by minimum human rights standards. It's like the European arrest warrant. You can zip people around Europe in this way because everyone respects everyone's rights, but we know that it's not true. So this actually really hit at the core of the common European asylum system. And actually, for those of you studying European Union law, even the sort of non-human rights related aspects of European Union law, this strikes at the heart of notions that are fundamental to the EU. Mutual recognition, mutual trust, mutual respect between member states. Now what member states of the EU have to say is, I don't know if I can trust you. Which doesn't only hit at asylum, it hits at other things like free movement of goods, right? The idea is that if uh, a tin of tomatoes is produced in Romania and exported here to, Roma, to Italy. The Italian authorities aren't supposed to open up the tomatoes and check to see that they're okay. They trust that they've been produced properly in Romania. All of those systems start to be called into question. So we have this judgment from the European Court of Human Rights. The Air Center intervened jointly with Amnesty International in that case. And basically, we put forward arguments that fed into all of this. And in particular, we were arguing that if Greece isn't complying with its obligations under EU law, to house asylum seekers, then there should be a violation found. So you see that there's a sort of intermingling there of EU law and the European Convention on Human Rights. What else did we do? Well, there were also cases pending before the domestic courts, before various member states, right? National courts were being asked to stop the removal of people to Greece. So we introduced as a third party in a case before the Court of Appeal in England and Wales, and in a case before the High Court in Ireland, in Dublin. And those two cases were referred to the Court of Justice of the EU. Are you all familiar with the, ref with the reference procedure before the CJEU, where national courts basically <coughs> ask questions of the Luxembourg Court? And so these two courts asked the Luxembourg Court, is it compatible with EU law to be sending these people back to Greece? A really tough question for Luxembourg, because Luxembourg is supposed to be applying all of those great principles, mutual recognition, mutual trust. And in that case, the court found that um, normally you should be able just to trust the other member state. But when there is evidence of a completed total failure of the asylum system, then you have a problem. And you, cannot, you, can, you can choose, but you can be obligated not to send people back. And it might be that it's for your state, for the UK, or France, or Belgium, to deal with the case. Now I'll get to case C 64811 in a moment. That's an interesting one that involves Italy. But I thought I would mention another case that we got involved in called AA Iraq. This was about a woman from Iraq who claimed asylum in Belgium with her brother. <coughs> While she was in Belgium, she claims that she was subjected inside the, the um, refugee, the, the asylum seeker, um, the, the, uh, the housing center. She claims that she was subjected to sexual abuse. And her brother found out about it and wanted to harm her. So she escaped with the help of some men. And they brought her to France and particularly to Calais. And you know that around Calais is that area that they refer to as the jungle. And that in that area, she was sort of sexually abused by all of these different groups who passed her from one to another. So may have even been trafficked, may have been, as we discussed before, transported from one place to another uh, by deception or by force for the purpose of sexual exploitation. She then gets in a truck that takes her to Britain. And the truck driver lets her out just outside the Home Office, the, the British Ministry of the Interior, and says, go there and claim asylum. 
And she did. And they take her fingerprints and they see, ah, you've already claimed asylum in Belgium. Under the Dublin regulation, Belgium is responsible for your claim. We're sending you back there. Now, you can't say that Belgium is like Greece. Right? It doesn't have a failed asylum system. But what you can say is that this woman probably has been traumatized enough by what's happened to her. And maybe we should just consider her asylum claim in Britain. But the UK doesn't want to consider her asylum claim in Britain, because she'll probably be eligible for refugee status, and then we'll have to let her live in Britain. And Britain's trying to rid itself of all the foreigners who were there. So they insist on trying to send her back. Now, we intervened in that case by saying, look, it's not just about the state to which you're being sent back committing a human rights violation because their system is so bad. It's also about people being so traumatized that they shouldn't be subject to another forced return, even within the European Union. We lost that case. I mean, we were third party interveners, so we weren't representing the applicant. But our point was obviously in favor of her, and we lost. So you see that it doesn't always work in favor of people. Um, in terms of what else we're doing, the Dublin II regulation is now being revised. So we're soon going to have the Dublin III regulation. So something else that we've done is that we've made submissions to the European Parliament's Lead Aid Committee, the Committee on Human Rights, to give them some of our views on how the current proposal should be changed in order to bring it in line with human rights. But I will say something about the, the new proposal for Dublin, the Dublin regulation, which is that it does add a lot of good things. It adds a specific remedy for people who are subject to Dublin returns. Um, it has stuff to say about detention, and it has stuff to say about the best interest of the child. Any questions about the Dublin II regulation before I get into this case that I was going to mention specifically, case C648 Yeah? Is the Dublin II regulation the same thing come up against Italy in relation to this? And this is the next case I'm going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll say generally, yes. Now, Italy isn't as bad as Greece when it comes to its asylum system, but Italy does have systemic problems. One of the systemic problems, some of you in the room will know this better than I do, but some of the systemic problems actually is that when you're an asylum seeker in Italy, you tend to have access to social support at some kind of a reception center. <coughs> Once you have been recognized as a refugee in Italy, often the support completely falls away. So ironically, the people that we actually know need to be protected from persecution are now sleeping rough in the streets of Rome, or maybe even here in Turin. Um, and there was a huge expose on this in The Guardian, one of the big British newspapers, that talked about people, charities, actually going to Termini Station in Rome and providing sandwiches to all the, not asylum seekers, but recognized refugees who are living in the train station. Um, so there is a huge problem with that. And there is one case that's pending before the European Court of Human Rights about a woman who was already recognized as a refugee in Italy. She was homeless here, so she came to Britain and asked for refugee status in Britain. And Britain said, no, 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 you're a refugee in Italy. Go back there. So you can imagine how desperate her situation is that she actually wants to ask for refugee status again in another member state. We've asked for permission to intervene in that case, but we're still waiting to hear back from the court. Um, but there's another question that we have. This is case C-648-11, which we've intervened in. This is what Article 6 of the Dublin II regulation says. This is one of the first criteria by which you determine which state is responsible for someone. And what it says is that where the applicant for asylum is an unaccompanied minor, the member state responsible for examining the application shall be that where a member of his or her family is legally present, provided that this is in the best interest of the minor. So for example, if you have a child who shows up in Britain and claims asylum and is unaccompanied, and they do a check and they figure out that that child's uncle is in Sweden, even though the child has never been to Sweden, the child should be sent to Sweden to have his or her asylum claim considered, assuming that that's in the best interest of the child. Now, if it turns out, for example, that the uncle is a convicted pedophile who's just finished a five-year jail term in Sweden, probably not a good idea to reunite the child with the uncle. But we can assume, maybe, in most circumstances, that it would be a good idea. But then we have the next paragraph. In the absence of a family member, the member state responsible for examining the application shall be that where the minor has lodged his or her application for asylum. So you have an unaccompanied minor who shows up in Britain, who lodges an asylum application in Britain. There's no family member. Britain is responsible. Easy enough. Let's say you have a child who first enters the EU through Italy, then makes his way to the UK 
never having talked to the Italian authorities at all, and applies for asylum in the UK. UK is the, the UK is the member state where the minor has lodged his application for asylum. The UK is responsible. Now imagine you have a situation where a child enters the EU via Italy, which many people do, claims asylum in Italy, things aren't so great in Italy, and so comes to the UK and claims asylum in the UK. Which member state do you think is responsible? This is the test. You're all you study law here, come on. Which is it, Italy or the UK? Where the, where the minor has lost his or her application for asylum? Why Italy? I mean, this is the question that's before the court, so there's no right or wrong answer yet, so feel free to say. the best interest of the child out of the way. Ah, interestingly though, this paragraph doesn't use that phrase, best interest of the child. What this paragraph points to is sort of an automatic determination. Yeah, what are you saying? But isn't it still implied in that phrase mm -hmm. in that the convention takes into consideration the convention on the rights of the child, which has to be interpreted according You're right, to yeah, yeah, exactly. And the rights of the child are also enshrined in the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights, Article 24 of that instrument. So you could read the rights of the child into this. But it's interesting that your first choice is to say Italy. Because the child has lodged two applications, actually. So yes, you might say the first country, which is what the UK is saying, obviously, because the UK wants to get rid of all of these kids. You might say the most recent country, which, is probably, which was, would be my starting point, actually. Because if this provision is meant to give preference to the child's choice, then you'd think that the child has changed his or her mind and now wants to claim asylum in the UK. Anyway, this is the question that the English Court of Appeal has sent to Luxembourg. In this regulation, where an applicant for asylum who is an unaccompanied minor with no member of his or family legally present in a member state has lodged claims for asylum in more than one member state, which member state does the second paragraph of Article 6 make responsible for determining the application for asylum? So that's now pending in Luxembourg. Now, this is a case where we actually disagree with the lawyers acting for the applicant, acting for the asylum seeking children. They say that it is always the most recent country. So in that scenario, it's always the UK. What we are saying is that it is whatever is in the best interest of the child, which will usually be the most recent country in which the child is claimed asylum. Because we're worried about a situation that we've seen in the past, where children first claim asylum in the UK and are then trafficked to Italy or to Greece or somewhere else and claim asylum there. It may be in those children's best interest to be brought back to Britain. Now, interestingly, in, what, in these cases, what happened was that you had two asylum seeking children who claimed asylum in Italy, then traveled onto the UK. And the UK actually sent one of them back to Italy. The lawyers tracked her down here. She was engaged in forced prostitution here in Italy. So they went to the High Court in England and had her brought back to the UK. And the UK, in the meantime, has given her refugee status. But this case continues because the court thinks that it's such an important point that, that the case should continue on public interest grounds. I want to say that Italy is the worst possible place for all asylum seekers. Yes, bad things are happening. And as I mentioned, bad things are happening in Britain as well. Large numbers of asylum seeking children are taken into care in the UK and then disappear. And it seems that they've been trafficked. And indeed, there was a huge problem with large numbers of Chinese children who were coming to the UK claiming asylum at Heathrow Airport and all claiming that they had the same uncle, and then being sent to live with that uncle. Because if you've got a family member in the UK, you're immediately placed with that family member. 150 Chinese children had the same uncle. And they were all placed with that uncle. And they all disappeared. So there you are. So it just shows administrative incompetence is not the, uh, not the specialty of any one member state of the European Union. Uh, human trafficking cases. We talked a little bit about what the definition of trafficking is. We've been heavily involved in this area, which is why the text has gotten so small. I apologize for that. Um, we represented three applicants, three human trafficking victims before the European Court of Human Rights. All three of these cases have involved situations where people have been trafficked to Britain, and the UK authorities want to expel them because they don't have any form of status in the UK. They've claimed asylum, and they've been refused. 
and they want to, the, the UK authorities want to expel them. And what we're saying is that if you expel this person <laughs> to her country of origin, she will be subjected to harm, including re-trafficking. And that's what the cases have relied on. Uh, the first two cases we settled. The third case is ongoing, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about them. We've also done some third-party interventions in these cases. We intervened in the Rancid case. The Rancid case was about a woman who was trafficked from Russia to Cyprus for the purposes of forced sex work. Um, she was killed. What actually happened in her case was that she was, uh, the, the Cypriots had something called an artiste visa. So you could get a visa to go to Cyprus to work as an artiste, like a dancer in a cabaret. Everyone knew that the nightclubs were using these visas to bring in women to work as prostitutes. And many of them were being trafficked. And yet the system was going on. So Ms. Ranseva got one of these visas. And what we know about her was that she went to work in this nightclub for about a week, and then she ran away. And then the men in the nightclub went and hunted her down and found her, and brought her to a police station, and said to the police, she's violating the terms of her visa. You have to kick her out of the country. And she stayed in the police station for a few hours. It was the middle of the night. And the police officer called his superiors, and they said, no, 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 no problem. You should let her go. Call them and tell them to come and pick her up. So the police officers called the men and said, you have to come and pick her up. And they apparently didn't want to, but the police insisted, so they came and picked her up. And she was found dead a few hours later on the pavement, outside the block of flats where one of these men lived. And it looked like she had tried to jump out the window to escape, and she fell. Whether she actually that, that would actually happen, whether it was made to look like that, she died. Um, it just got investigated, that act of human trafficking. Coobo v. UK is about human trafficking and about failures to investigate forced labor trafficking. CN v. UK is about a similar matter, failure to investigate by the police. CN v. France is about failure to investigate in a case involving a UNESCO diplomat in Paris. And BM v. France and BF v. France are about sex trafficking victims from Nigeria who are to be found all over Western Europe. Spain, Italy, France, Britain. Um, and the, the threat to, um, to expel them. And the domestic courts, I put question marks, so it's meant to be the last case, the one that I was talking to you about. The, um, the kids who were brought back to Italy and then apparently trafficked here and bought and forced sex work. In terms of the ransom, I thought this would give you a pretty good indication of how a third party intervention in a migration case can be really useful. Because this is the first case where the court actually addressed human trafficking head on. And there's no international jurisprudence on human trafficking, except from the European Court of Human Rights. So the European Court didn't really have anything to hang its hat on. So in those cases, the third party intervener can provide a source for the case law of the court. And this is one of the paragraphs. This is about whether Ms. Ranseva was uh, unlawfully detained in the flat before she was killed. And this is what the court said. The court has already expressed concern that the police chose to, chose to hand Ms. Ranseva into Ebe's custody, the trafficker's custody, rather than simply allowing her to leave. Ms. Ranseva was not a minor. According to the evidence of the police officers on duty, she displayed no signs of drunkenness. This is one of the debates. They were saying she was drunk when she was the police station. It is insufficient for the Cypriot authorities to argue that there is no evidence that Ms. Ranseva did not consent to leaving with M.A. We got another one of these wonderful double negative sentences from the European Court. As the Air Center pointed out, that makes me very happy, as the Air Center pointed out, victims of trafficking often suffer severe physical and psychological consequences which render them too traumatized to present themselves as victims. So we made submissions to the court about how human trafficking victims don't show up to the police station and say, I am a victim of trafficking. Because it's not a crime that people understand very well, right? A person's not going to show up and say, I was moved by means of deception for the purposes of exploitation. I mean, you think about serious crimes, right? If you've been a victim of a mugging, you'd probably go to a police station here in Turin and say, I was mugged, I was attacked. There are some very sensitive crimes, of course, like sexual violence, where people aren't necessarily able to talk about it. But that isn't because they don't necessarily understand what it is to be a victim of rape. It's because the, tra the consequences have been too traumatizing for them, for them to be able to talk about it. But with human trafficking, people don't even understand what it is as a crime. And so we're very unlikely to go to a police station and say, I was trafficked. And that's what we were able to get across to the court. We were quite pleased with that. 
Um, in the LR case, I won't go into this in too much detail because I think I've, we've only got about a half an hour left. I've got a few other things to get into. But I, these are the facts of the case. And I've already mentioned it to you a little bit before. She was an Albanian national who was living legally here in Italy. Uh, she was brought to the United Kingdom by an Albanian man, indeed, who had abducted her in Italy. She was forced to work against her will as a prostitute in a nightclub in Leeds for at least one week before managing to escape. Uh, she reported incidents of kidnapping and sexual assault to the police. She was referred to the Poppy Project in NGO. And then, and this is um, probably one of the more grim aspects of the case, but I think it shows how dedicated she was to helping the police track down the, um, the trafficker. She, had, she terminated her pregnancy, and she allowed the police to take evidence from the termination of the pregnancy to figure out if the trafficker was the one who had impregnated her. Now, it turned out that that wasn't the case. It was probably one of the clients who had done so. But it shows, actually, how cooperative she was with the police. Because Albanian trafficking victims are notoriously unwilling to cooperate with the police because of the huge amount of fear that they experience from the traffickers, because of the way that those networks work. Um, but she did tell the police who he was. They arrested him. They decided they didn't have enough evidence to prosecute him. The Crown Prosecution Service said they didn't have enough evidence to go after him. So they deported him to Albania, and they wanted to deport her to Albania as well. A very small country where he would easily be able to track her down. And she's also from a bit of Albania, a very traditional place, where her family, knowing that she had had sex with men outside of marriage, would be looking to harm her as well. What we were able to do in that case was we were able to secure a friendly settlement for her, which involved the UK agreeing to give her refugee status. And so she stayed in the UK. <laughs> um, I thought I would also tell you about the OGO case. It's quite recent. Um, but on the 8th of March of this year, 2012, we got a phone call in our office from a barrister who said that she was calling in a bit of a panic because she had just been instructed in this case about a Nigerian woman who had been, as a small child, given to a family. So her mother had died when she was very young, her father died when she was five, and her stepmother gave her away to another family in Nigeria, and she worked for that family. And that family eventually gave her away to another family who brought her to Lagos in Nigeria, and she worked for them there as a domestic worker. And then they brought her to the UK, where she continued to work for them as a domestic worker. Uh, she grew up, they let her go, I guess assuming that she was no longer of any use to them, uh, and she just lived in the UK as an undocumented migrant. And she became involved in a relationship with someone who was abusive to her, so she called the police, and the police were less interested in the abuse against her and more interested in the fact that she was an undocumented migrant living in the UK. So she claimed asylum. She wasn't believed, her story wasn't believed, that she was a victim of trafficking. And on the 8th of March, the day that we were run off at the air center, they were planning on putting her on a plane back to Nigeria that night. So what we did that very day was we, we wrote to the European Court of Human Rights and asked them for one of these Rule 39 measures to stop them from removing her. And they agreed to it. Uh, we wrote to the courts. Uh, what's interesting in this case, actually, is that in the UK, there's something called judicial review proceedings, which is a kind of special proceeding when you don't have a right of appeal against something, but you're complaining about some act or omission by the authorities. You can always go to the High Court in the UK, in England, and ask for judicial review, some kind of review of the action of the authorities of being lawful or unlawful. So at the same time that we were going to the European Court of Human Rights to ask them to stop her removal, she went to the High Court of Justice to do the same thing. Now the High Court of Justice never issued an injunction, but there are still proceedings going on before that court. So you might ask, have we not exhausted domestic remedies yet? But because the High Court has done nothing to stop her removal, we're claiming that the High Court proceedings are ineffective, and therefore we're allowed to proceed in strategy. So we wrote to the court on the 25th of March saying to them that these judicial review proceedings are going on, but they're not effective. Uh, on the 5th of April, the government wrote to the court with information that the court had requested. On the 5th of April, we lodged a full application with the court. Only four weeks that we had to lodge a full application. It was a hurry, but we did it. And just a few weeks ago, the court communicated the case to the UK government. That opens up a 12-week window for organizations to ask the court to intervene in the case. So we're going to assemble a meeting within the next two weeks with a group of NGOs who are experts on child trafficking 
uh, within Nigeria and also on the rights of women asylum seekers in the UK and ask them to intervene in the case. It'll be a tricky one though because she's not at risk from the traffickers. What she's really at risk of is poverty. And one of the things that we'll be arguing actually is that just like it was illegal for Belgium to send that asylum seeker to face poverty back in Greece, it's illegal for the UK to send Ms. OGO back to face poverty in Nigeria. But that's a really controversial argument to make. Because a lot of people who are in Europe trying to avoid expulsion will say that they're facing poverty in the countries that they come from. Because uh, Europe's a rich place. Any questions about trafficking before you move on from that? Then I think the, um, the second to last topic that I had was right to an effective remedy. Those of you who are familiar with the Refugee Convention, one of the things you may know about that convention is that it says nothing about remedies. So it says a person is a refugee who, and then gives the definition. But it doesn't say anything about what remedy you have if they refuse to call you a refugee, if they refuse to identify you. And I know you're from the back from Australia. Huge issues in Australia about procedures for refugee status. It's one of the things that Australia loves to do is that it loves to take all of the asylum seekers who show up very rudely without warning in Australia and ship them off to Papua New Guinea or Nauru to have their claims heard over there, where they don't have access to proper procedures. Well, in Europe, we now have the idea that there is a remedy against an asylum decision. So if you say to the authorities, I am a refugee, I am entitled to protection, and the authorities say, no, you're not, because we don't believe you, or we, we do believe you, but nothing bad is going to happen to you based on what you're saying. You have a right to go to some kind of decision maker to review that decision. Uh, well, one of the things that we have going on now is the OGO case. The idea that she's, she did have a remedy and that she went through the asylum system, but we're saying that no one actually took her claims about trafficking seriously. So the remedy was not really effective, and we certainly don't have an effective remedy in the form of the judicial review proceedings. We have another case that's quite interesting, X, Y, and Z versus the United Kingdom. This is a case about a woman who's from Sri Lanka. She's from the Tamil ethnic minority in Sri Lanka. You've probably heard something about the civil war in Sri Lanka, which ended not that long ago, between the Tamil minority and the majority population. Um, her brother actually came to the UK many years ago and was recognized as a refugee, and their mother is living in the UK. Uh, this woman, X, she was living in the Tamil area of the country with her husband, who was actually a justice of the peace, and their children. And when things got quite violent, quite violent in that area, they moved to Colombo, which is the capital of Sri Lanka, but obviously not an area where the Tamils are in the majority. And she says that her husband and children were abducted and disappeared. She herself was abducted twice, she says, and subjected to ill treatment. She came to the UK. She got a visitor's visa, actually, from the UK authorities to visit her family in the UK. And a few weeks after she got to Britain, she claimed asylum. The authorities didn't believe her. They said that her story made no sense, that it didn't hold together. They said that it sounded like a carry-on film. Do you know what I mean with the carry-on film? They were a series of British slapstick comedies from the 50s and 60s. Um, they said that, uh, they actually, one of the judges said that her brother was clearly lying, that he had abused the hospitality that Britain had offered him by bringing his sister here and having her take advantage of the National Health Service. Um, he abused his hospitality, but that's actually a British citizen now. So it's still considered to be someone who can abuse Britain's hospitality. Um, and they dismissed her claim. Later on, she decided to reveal that she had been raped, which is something that she didn't want to reveal before. I'm sure you all will be familiar with some of the research that's been done on women victims of sexual violence and how they're often reluctant to disclose that sort of thing. So she discloses that she was actually raped, and she puts in what's called a fresh claim for asylum, asking for her case to be reconsidered based on this new evidence. The British authorities say, we're not giving you asylum based on this. And actually, this fresh claim isn't even a real fresh claim. Because this information is of so little importance to the claim that we're not even going to recognize it as a new claim for asylum. And we're not going to give you a right of appeal. Which meant that she had no remedy that could suspend her removal in the case. 
So all that she had in her case was the possibility to judicially review, which is to go to the high court and ask them to stop her removal. So that's what she did. She went to the high court in England and said, please issue an injunction to stop my removal. She puts in her claim at around 2 p.m. on the day that the flight is going to take off. So does everyone else in the flight. All the papers go to the same judge. The judge makes his way through the papers. He pulls a few people off the plane. He says, no, take that one off the plane, take that one off the plane, that one can stay on the plane, this one can stay on the plane. 2.45 p.m., the British authorities say to the judge, we're closing the door to the plane now. So the judge says, well, I did my best, right? But hers is still at the bottom of the pile, so he doesn't get to hers. Interestingly, the plane didn't actually take off until 8 o'clock at night. So he could have looked at those papers, but he didn't. The plane took off, she's back in Sri Lanka now. Now what we're saying, sorry, I mean, is something under Gebrevedi versus France. This was a case about the, uh, against the, uh, the French authorities, which says that any time you're going to have a remedy against a removal of a person, you're claiming that she'll be subjected to a human integrated treatment, that remedy must have automatic suspensive effect. Invoking the remedy must stop the plane from taking off. Now the problem in her case is that the British authorities were claiming that she already had a remedy because she went through the asylum process. She had the judge who said that this all sounded like a carry-on film. And she said that her brother was abusing Britain's hospitality. But what we're saying is that the new claim was so significant that it should have triggered a new remedy with automatic suspensive effect. That case is now pending in the European Court of Human Rights. Yeah. But how do you see the new um, evidence to be so um, relevant to her claim? I mean, rape is something that could happen to anybody as ordinary crime, and I don't think it could justify uh, prevention of uh, refoulement or yeah. uh, extra. What we're saying, no, no, yeah, you're right, comment. It's, what we're saying is that the problem with her case is that she wasn't believed. They said she was making the whole thing up. And what we're saying is that the rape allegation actually puts into place the fact that she's under a lot of psychological pressure, that she's been a victim of trauma, that she needs specialists to talk to her, to help her elaborate her claims and go into what she's been through. And only in the light of that medical evidence can we actually make a proper decision as to whether she's telling the truth or not. So for example, when she first made her claim, she had male interpreters. So she felt less willing to talk to them. She didn't tell the judge the whole story. That's really the basis of the claim. That, that, that that's key to the whole story. And there is, interestingly, um, a lot of guidelines that exist in the UK in particular, judge guidelines, judicial guidelines, that say that women who have been subjected to sexual violence will often need more time to develop their claims, will need access to support, and that they should be maybe given more of a benefit of the doubt in their claims, because the psychological pressure that they're under means that it may be more difficult for them to tell their story. So that's really the basis of the claim. Um, interestingly, after we lodged this claim, on the front page of one of the national newspapers in the UK, there was a story about people being sent back to Sri Lanka and tortured. Uh, people sent back from Britain to Sri Lanka and tortured. Um, so it has been in the news that this is going on, that the UK has probably already violated its human rights obligations in respect of people sent back to Sri Lanka. Um, so we're hoping that our case will win. But you asked before about what happens to the clients in the meantime. Well, she's in Sri Lanka, hiding. And she's not been able to find her husband or children. So it's quite sad what happens in the meantime. And maybe the best thing that could happen to her would be for her to, um, to get a friendly settlement decision in her case. It would be very hard to bring her back. I think. Oh, sorry, this is, yeah, this is the argument, sorry. Apple was a victim of rape. She did not disclose the first of the proceedings in which she was not believed. To express that, which is refused in her right of appeal, she was expelled while judicial review was pending. So our argument is just as we said about there. So that's some of the stuff that we're doing on behalf of asylum seekers. I'm seeing if I... Oh, sorry, I did have one last category that I'll go into, but then I may give you some time for discussion and questions because I've been talking a lot at you. Just to say that Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights does involve, uh, does protect the right to respect for family life, 
and a lot of times asylum seekers and refugees who come to Europe have difficulties in this respect. Um, we took on two cases in the European Court of Human Rights. The O'Donoghue case was about a rule that existed in the UK that you could not get married in the UK if you were subject to immigration control and you didn't have permission from the authorities. So the idea was that if you were a person who needed permission to be in the UK, you needed to pay a 300 pound fee and get the authorities to stamp approval of your marriage before you could go and get married. There was an exception to this rule if you got married in the Church of England, because there is, in the UK, an official church. So you could, if you could get an Anglican priest to marry you, you didn't have to pay the 300 pounds or get permission. And of course, if you're in Northern Ireland, there is no Church of England, so you didn't have access to this. So perhaps more importantly, if you're not an Anglican, you might not want to get married in the Church of England. Um, so here we are with this case. The O'Donoghue's were actually a couple living in Northern Ireland. She was a British and Irish citizen. He was a refugee. And they wanted to get married. And they couldn't afford the 300 pounds. It wasn't just an asylum seeker. He was an actual recognized refugee. So he had nothing to gain from marrying a British citizen in terms of his immigration status. And so they, we took their case to the European Court of Human Rights and found that this rule was unlawful. You can't prevent people from marrying based on their immigration status. Uh, the Mala case and the AE case, I'll talk to you about more in a second, um, but those are other cases that we've taken on. The Mala case, I think, is quite interesting. Ms. Mala came to the UK from Cameroon to claim asylum. Her asylum claim failed, but like many people who claimed asylum in the UK in the first decade of the 21st century, her case was put into a massive pile. There weren't enough resources invested in this. It lingered for a long time, and no one bothered to actually try to scoop her up and chuck her out of the country. So she just kind of was hanging out in the UK for a long time. And while she was hanging out in the UK, she met a guy, originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo, who had a permanent residence status in the UK, and they had a child together. And because that man, the father, had permanent residence status in Britain, the child became a British citizen automatically on birth. And then the UK authorities finally decided they were going to expel them from the UK. So they scooped her up with the child and put them in an immigration removal center, the equivalent of the centers that you have here in Italy. A British citizen went into one of those places, a small child, and the woman, our client, had a nervous breakdown in the detention center and completely started freaking out. And so they removed the child from her. And they placed the child first with the social services in the area and then with the father. And then they expelled the mother to Cameroon. This is before we even get to know the mother, actually. She made her own application to the European Court of Human Rights from Cameroon. Finally, so that's, this happens in April 2008. She gets removed. She submits her own application. Two years later, so you can see how overburdened the court is. They don't mind that she's separated from her child this whole time. The court asks the government for more information about the case. The government responds to the court. And then in September 2010, the court communicates the case to the parties. She then gets in touch with the Air Center. We spend every day on the telephone to Cameroon. Phone lines aren't necessarily very good between the UK and Cameroon. Sometimes we were able to talk, sometimes we weren't. And we organized a friendly settlement for her. The UK authorities basically said that she could get an entry visa to come back to the UK, that she would get three years leave to remain in the UK, and that they would pay her 4,000 pounds. So we used the money to buy her a plane ticket. It took us a month to get her a passport, which was already hard enough. She got a visa from the UK authorities in Cameroon, and now in the UK she actually got her three years to pay to remain. Yeah? Well, if someone makes an application to the court and they're applying in circumstances where it seems as though they might not have a lawyer who's like an expert in ECHR law, for example, the outside of the jurisdiction, does the court do anything proactive to give them representation? In theory, all the courts, have, well, you don't need a lawyer to make an application to the court. But for example, where you might be able to have a section, the injunction type relief, I think the court will probably be generous with applicants in person who don't have the support of a lawyer. I have seen cases, for example, of people who have gotten Rule 39 indication and then come to the air center saying, will you represent me? And then I, the first thing I said to them is, can I see what you wrote to the court? And what they literally did was they scrolled on a piece of paper, I'm being sent back to Somalia tonight, right, sort of in very bad English. Help me. And the court gave them a Rule 39. Now, the air center scrawled that on a piece of air center letterhead. I don't think we'd get it anywhere. So I do think that they're generous with 
law. After the case is communicated to the government, you need a lawyer. Um, the court will sometimes, registry lawyers in the court will sometimes informally contact us and ask us to take on a case. So we have done that. Um, but no, in theory, the court won't, won't at a formal level be proactive at all. They'll just write to the applicant and say, you need a lawyer now. And they have to go out and find someone. So okay, yes, it can be quite messy. Um, one of the interesting pieces of research that we wanted to do is actually to see in terms of the cases that get thrown out at the European court, how many are brought by lawyers and how many are brought by people without lawyers. Um, but to be honest, I'm not sure that that makes a big difference. Because I think there are a lot of lawyers in Europe who don't really understand how the court works the convention works. The only other case that I thought I would mention to you is about LGBT asylum seekers. You have a lot of people who come to Europe seeking asylum based on their sexual orientation, saying that they're gay or lesbian, and that in their country of origin, uh, gay men and lesbians get beaten up or killed. Uh, for example, Jamaica is a place where it's very, very common to go to violence against LGBT people. Um, there was a case in the European Court of Human Rights back in 2004 by an Iranian man who came to the UK and said, I'm gay, if you send me back to Iran, I'll be killed. Now these cases raise interesting questions about the right to respect for private life and family life of these people, because what the UK government and other governments have said to them is, oh, don't worry, you can go home to Iran or Jamaica or wherever, just don't tell people that you're gay, <laughs> and you'll be fine. And this can take various forms, right? Don't pursue any kind of a romantic or sexual relationship with anyone, or do it, but keep it on the, on the down low. And, um, and you'll be fine, right? You'll avoid that sort of thing. Uh, and so the question has been, can you say to someone, go home and stay in the closet? Now, in 2004, the European Court of Human Rights said, yes, you can. And this is what the European Court actually said. On a purely pragmatic basis, it cannot be required that an expelling contracting state only return an alien to a country which is in full and effective enforcement of all the rights and freedoms set out in the Convention. So what the European Court of Human Rights was saying was that in Europe, you have to treat LGBT people with, people with respect, right? You can't criminalize homosexuality in a European country. You must protect LGBT people from violence in Europe. But we can't expect the rest of the world to behave the way that European states behave. And we can't expect states to refrain from sending you back to a place where life might not be as good for gay people as it is in Europe. That was a really disappointing decision of the European Court. Now, things are starting to turn around on this. The major case in this area has been the HJ and HT judgment of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom last year. This is definitely the most progressive jurisprudence on this. Uh, these were two men, one from Iran and one from Cameroon. And this was Lord Rogers' judgment in the case. And it, it, it raised the question of Rogers, actually. And what Lord Rogers said, and this was actually interpreting the Refugee Convention as applied in UK law, was in short, what is protected is the applicant's right to live freely and openly as a gay man. So you're seeing a different perspective on this. That involves a wide spectrum of conduct, going well beyond conduct designed to attract sexual partners and maintain relationships with them. To illustrate the point with trivial stereotypical examples from British society. Just as male heterosexuals are free to enjoy themselves playing rugby, drinking beer, and talking about girls with their mates, so male homosexuals are to be free to enjoy themselves going to Kylie concerts, drinking exotically colored cocktails, and talking about boys with their straight female mates. Mutatis mutandis. And in many cases, the adaptations would obviously be great. The same must apply to other societies. And of course, the front cover of the tabloid newspapers in Britain the next day, gay asylum seekers must be allowed to go to Kylie concerts. Instead of the And so that's the case where we have now basically the UK authorities are no longer allowed to tell people claiming uh, asylum based on their sexual orientation, you can just go home and stay in the closet. And, when I, and I know it was really tough. I had colleagues and friends who were taking these cases in the UK courts before this judgment came out. And what you had to prove was that the person was so obviously gay that there was no way that he or she would be able to stay in the closet. You can imagine the kinds of things that people got up to, right? The lawyers would tell their clients, well, they're going to have to believe that you're so gay 
that you can't possibly go back. And so that you'd have guys showing up and sort of, you know, wearing lipstick and going to court and sort of trying to act as gay as possible in order to avoid being sent back to their countries of origin. And the point actually now is you don't have to subject yourself to that kind of absurd ridiculous. It's enough for you to say that you are, you are free to live freely and openly as a member of a sexual minority. Um, it would be really great to see this at European level, to have a European judgment saying the same thing. And we would like to see this, so we've intervened, we've asked for permission to intervene in Aid versus Finland, which is about an, an, an Iranian gay man who the Finnish authorities want to send back to Iran. Uh, but the case is now uh, on hold because the Finnish authorities have decided to look at the case again to try to avoid a judgment in the court. Interestingly, the German courts were faced with a gay man from Iran, and they decided to send a question to the Court of Justice of the EU asking whether as a matter of EU asylum law, you could give someone this choice between sort of go home and stay in the closet, or come out of the closet, it's your choice, and get beaten up and killed, or in Iran, hanged, because it's a criminal offense. Um, interestingly, what happened was that the German court sent this to the Court of Justice of the European Union, and the Court of Justice of the European Union published the asylum seeker's name on its website. At which point the German court said, well, that's not very helpful, because now everyone in Iran, in Iran will know that this man is gay. So the German authorities gave him refugee status and the case was withdrawn. <laughs> there are very easy ways to win your cases. <laughs> Uh, so that, I think, is all that I had. I've only left about five minutes for questions now, but if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation, from Paul. And also, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. As you know, all those cases of migrants, they are very sensitive in terms of time. But also, as you know, we need from two years up to six years in order to get final decision. So how does the European Court of Human Rights prioritize all those cases? The European Court actually has a system now <coughs> for prioritizing cases. Um, because they're so overwhelmed with cases that they can no longer do things on a first-come, first-served basis. So if you have a case where you're saying that someone is now facing torture or a human or degrading treatment, or you have a case where the rights of a child are an issue, the court will give that case urgent consideration. So for example, our Sri Lankan client who's back in Sri Lanka, we lodged our application on the 16th of May. The court has since called us to ask us for an electronic version of our application, presumably so they can cut and paste bits of the application into a document that they're going to make public. So I'm assuming that that case will be communicated within the next few weeks, being given urgent priority. When we get a Rule 39 measure in a case, the court case doesn't have quite as much urgency because our client hasn't been sent back yet. But it has more urgency than a normal case because the government is, is sort of chafing, is irritated at the fact that the court has issued this Rule 39 measure, preventing the state from doing what it wants to do. So these migrant rights cases will tend to get relatively urgent treatment. But the fact that the court is slow isn't always a bad thing. I mentioned to you the case of AA versus UK. This was the Nigerian guy who committed gang rape. We launched his application back in 2008. The court waited until 2010 to communicate the case. And it then took another year and a half for the court to actually deliver a judgment. So it was three and a half years between us lodging the case and the case being decided. In the meantime, our client continued to behave very well. He continued to strengthen his bonds with his mother and his sisters. He got a job in the UK. His family life deepened, his private life deepened. And so that actually helped our case. Because in the end, what the court said was that the question was about a prospective violation if the UK were to expel him in the future. And the court said, well, it's now been so long, you couldn't possibly expel him. It might have been acceptable to expel him back in 2008. But the question before us is whether it's appropriate to expel him now. And so interestingly, the, court, the message that the court sent was, our delay made it so that you could no longer expel him. And we won. So it's not always a bad thing in the migration case. Um, and the same thing with any of these cases involving a Rule 39. It may be, for example, that your client, in the meantime, meets a nice person who has citizenship and they decide to get married. Or that your client has a child. I mentioned to you the LR case, the Albanian lady. While that litigation was going on, she got pregnant again. And she had the child. And so she had a child born in the UK. Now, that child wasn't entitled to British citizenship, so it didn't make too much of a difference. 
but now she'd be in the more awful situation of returning to Albania with a child. So now her family already knew that she had had sex outside of marriage, but now it would be painfully obvious that she had had sex outside of marriage, making it all the more urgent to give her protection. So the delays can work in your favor. Um, I think actually it's the government that hates the delays at this point. Um, but interestingly, there's a whole reform of the court process going on. Um, this started in Interlaken a few years ago in Switzerland. There was a meeting in uh, Izmir in Turkey in 2011 about this. In Brighton, in England, there was this meeting. The governments are desperate to stop the court from meddling in these sort of issues. And the UK is desperate to stop the court from meddling in these Article 8 family left cases. Because they don't want these things to be overturned by the European court. So in the next few years, we might actually see the European court changing dramatically. Uh, it might not have jurisdiction to hear a lot of these cases anymore. What the UK would like to see, what some other embassies would like to see, would be that the European court is not allowed to hear a case if it's already been heard by one of the higher courts in a country. Um, and that would be very damaging. Because uh, just because, like I said in England, just because someone wears a, a wig and a sword, they're a very good judge. Any other questions? Yeah. I think I've got a slide from you on how to get in touch with me. Have you got my email address? We do have an internship program at the Air Center as well, so you can check that out if you're interested in maybe coming to London and spending a couple of months working with us. Okay, well, thank you for your attention for so long.